So, right, it's four o'clock. Uh, I think we're ready to kick this off. Cool, let's do it. Fantastic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar today. To introduce myself, I'm Juliette and the digital marketer at MZN. Today's speaker is Chris, our managing director. Uh, before I hand it over to Chris, I'd just like to give you a little bit of an overview. So today we will be chatting about leading an NGO through uncertain times. Uh, in, this in, in this webinar, we will share how we use financial scenario planning to help our NGO partners navigate disruptive times. As we all know, we are in quite disruptive times at the moment. So welcome to everybody. Please feel free to drop us a line in the comments to introduce yourselves. Tell us about your organization and let us know where you're logging in from. Just a quick note, the slides and recording will be shared after the webinar is finished. If you do not receive this, please do email us at hello at mzninternational.com. Uh, we will give you as much time as we can for questions at the end. So please do enter your question into the question box and we will uh, once we finish the webinar, we will get to each question. Um, I think that is it. I think it's over to Chris. Super. Thank you very much, Jules. Um, appreciate it. Hello, everybody, to this somewhat technical webinar, uh, encryptingly labeled uh, scenario planning and financial performance. This is all to say, in uncertain times, what can we actually look at fairly certainly? So I'm hoping, my hopes for this brief chat of about 20 minutes, half an hour max, is to give those of you who are not financial experts, who uh, just want to run a well-running uh, NGO, a tool um, to uh, create a little bit more certainty in an otherwise un very uncertain time. So that's my goal today, and uh, I'd love to hear yours. And as Jewel said, please feel free to pop the questions into the Q&A so we get around to them. Um, and if there are any questions left that we don't get around to, because I have a hard uh, finish here at um, 15.50 today, Jules, um, then uh, we'll email out to you and we'll sort them out one-on-one. -on -one. Great. Um, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm the MD for MZN International. Um, you know MZN. We are basically helping NGOs to be better funded, operate better, and deploy so, so smarter strategies. Uh, Jules, would you like to briefly say that our in-person training is back and um, what exactly that takes? What oh, we are very excited to offer, offer our in-person training. If you take a look at our website, uh, we've got information on our training courses that we are offering around the world. Um, so we would be very excited to invite any organization out there to gain further knowledge. Uh, if you do look at our training courses on our website, you can see the different courses we offer and we would love to host you. Great, and not to forget that if you are already an MZN partner, then you can even attend in those countries for free, I believe, uh, to a certain amount of people. I think you can occupy the whole course, but there's a fair use policy. Good, let's start. Um, uncertainty really affects everything, and I'm sure you have been in some sort of organization um, that has faced some sort of uh, uncertainty before. A certain amount of uncertainty, of course, is, is normal life. But when we don't know what money is coming in, what impact we're going to have on the, on the head office and the core office, what the country offices are doing, what program we're going to run, if things are changing so much, then I believe this starts having a corrosive effect. It has an effect on the strategy that is not quite sure, the people we have, the people, how we manage people is not sure, and ultimately the resources we are using and we can mobilize. Um, a lot of that we can't really plan. We have to accept what's been given to us in a way, or what the circumstances we face. But there is actually the financial part. We can. And my ambition for today is to leave you with a simple message. Um, when all things are unsure, doing a decent financial planning is the one thing you can be pretty sure about. And that helps in a lot of to put a floor over the other's uncertainties. And that has an effect on management, on staff, because suddenly you can go to your colleagues and say, look, all these things might happen, but at least we know at the worst case, that is our scenario. So this is how many people we have. This is how, what we can do. So that scenario-based financial planning is not just something for financial boffins like myself, but 
something that's really useful and lets you sleep at night. Yeah. Uh, and also makes you sure that you don't overpromise anything. So um, here are the talking points for today. I want to give you some top tips that are hopefully really pragmatic. And I want to confront this um, skepticism, I'm going to call it. Why do we even plan for it when everything is so uncertain? So how do we actually, why even do it? Because some people say this, well, oh, you can't plan for anything these days, so why even do that? Um, and then I want to leave you with a few tips of how to create, how do I create a good enough financial scenario? This is something you can do in your organization this afternoon. Um, it doesn't take a consultant. It doesn't take a huge amount of meeting. You don't need to be a financial expert for it. It's right now that you can do that. And it's, it's not great, but it's probably good enough for, for, uh, if you have nothing. And finally, with some, I want to leave you with some questions and some uh, uh, some topics that your financial scenario should give you at the very least. So it's a very specific to topic today on how to manage and build a better NGO. And it's set in front of the background of very uncertain times. Now I'm going to use our friends at Interaction here, who've kindly given us permission to reproduce their latest NGO CEO survey. Uh, it's a very recommend, I very much recommend reading the survey. If you want a link to it, please email us. Um, I think we have the document as well. The summarized nuts and bolts of this survey are, uh, I don't know, Jules, can you see my cursor as well? Is this translating? Good, I'll take that as a yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, is that 80% uh, or so of the um, uh, leaders of NGO makers, uh, leaders agree that the external operating environment is significantly changing. So we are very much in agreement that there is a lot of change about uh, and this change occurs in the donor landscape. We can't really rely on institutional donors. They change their policies rapidly. Many of them are reducing grants and it feels like NGOs are sort of fighting over scraps here. There's a massive amount of competition coming on um, at the moment from social enterprises and other corporates that are invading what is traditionally the area of grants and NGOs, the uh, still um, uh, not, not completed COVID-19, and it did obviously last year, climate change and these other crises disrupt our traditional way we do programming. And the last point in particular has a, um, has a very concrete consequence. It means that we can't implement programs as planned or as budgeted, and that has an impact on the organization. We'll look into that later. So financial scenario planning, as you know, grand as this title sounds, um, but what it is, it's the answer to the question of what if. And I know it's a bit of a text-heavy slide here, but it basically starts with uh, four steps. Let's, taking, let's take back control of all this uncertainty and to do two or three things and do them well. Number one, let's get on top of the numbers. Now, the, uh, the first step really to, to better management and to knowing where our vulnerabilities right, right now are is really understand the numbers, identify the trends in how we spend, and ref uh, refreshing ourselves, with the, uh, refreshing our policies and procedures to optimize them. That's an easy one to do. It's basically saying, hey, off the program implementation over the last three years, in which month have we implemented most? What's our spending cycle? Is there a trend here? Let's update ourselves just on what's happening without any judgment. Number two, cost control. Expenses are pretty often overlooked, weirdly enough. Uh, we always look at what we are allowed to spend, not, not, not so much we spend. And a critical eye over these expenses can really help be the first step of reducing organizational costs. Sometimes we lump expenses, be they restricted or unrestricted, into categories. And if that appears low enough or if it appears similar to last year, we're sort of going with it and it's fine. We're busy anyway, so let's not question it. Taking, just reviewing the expenses we're having and being reasonable on what we should spend money on um, and what not is a really good step in a really common step in uh, managing our money first. And that goes the other way around. If we spend too little, for example, on recruitment, but we don't have enough staff, uh, but there is a budget for that, 
then there's probably a correlation for that. We should probably spend more on that. Finally, if we're really cash strapped, a weekly cash flow statement can really help. So cash here is king in terms of uncertainty, and we can uh, create cash flow statement that have us understand the timing of income and expenditure. Because when there is so much uncertainty, it's the timing that matters. When does the donor pay? When are we receiving this fund? And when do we time the expense? It's not often not the, the month overview or the year overview, then everything looks all right. It's within those years that things can be very difficult. And finally, analyze and plan your data and using scenarios, which I guess down to a second. So all these things should appear sort of common sense. They are, should be nothing in there that, um, that shocks you that it isn't done. Maybe you do it to some, some degree, but maybe it's something we can get better at. Um, having done that, um, we need to use this as a base to do financial planning and scenario plan. And before I go into showing how and what the effect is, and I use an example for you, I'd like to show you why. Number one, let's reduce the risk. We really want to determine all possible outcomes of an action so that the organization can actively reduce its risks, maximize potential. Um, the biggest risk, as they famously say, is the one we don't know about. Of course, we, we have risks, some of them very critical, but we need to have them on our radar. We really do it financial scenario planning as well to support decision making. So having, a, having created this range of possible outcomes of what if, what happens if this happens, that can be really be useful to management to drive decision making, to reason it, and to make decision making more data led, more evidence led. You want to create a baseline. As I said at the very beginning, despite there being so many uncertainties, we know the worst case scenario looks like this, the best case scenario looks like this. So it puts a floor and a ceiling in what we believe are the major uh, likelihoods of outcomes. And that creates security. Let's, it may let you sleep at night. It may be your answer to worried colleagues, and it may be your uh, best guide for determining the future. Best of all, when something happens, either positive or negative, you have a scenario for it. And ultimately, it just always helps. You know, it might, many of our NGO partners have started financial scenario planning in the pandemic, but it's generally a good practice for future planning so that we know what, what we do if the following happens. If a program doesn't implement as much, if a, a country has to close, if we need to suddenly respond to another country, all these scenarios. Good, so hopefully that's the answer to why we do it. Now we become a little bit more technical, so please bear with me. You are talking with German channel of accountants, so I'm sorry. Remember that income is often more variable than expenses, as professionally shown here in this very uh, detailed uh, drawn diagram. If we are looking at the short term and the long term at the bottom, and if we take this green line as income, and income can sometimes, like during the pandemic, for example, the fundraising, rapidly reduce. Whereas your expenses, in the short term at least, seem pretty fixed. And that's because it takes a while until you've you know, reduced staff numbers. It takes a while until you have changed the lease on your office or until you have downgraded your online systems. They are obviously more flexible in the long term, but in the short term, it is usually not possible to massively reduce costs just from one month to the next, whereas your income can change rapidly. So that basic knowledge that um, funded donor-funded income and other income is more variable than costs requires you to make that scenario planning. It makes it even more important because it enables us to forecast the financial impact of a reduced income scenario under different, uh, expect, under different realities. And we get into an example in a second. Um, that is the best reason to do it, by the way. So let's become a little bit technical. And yes, there are numbers. Please bear with me. And this sounds like a, you know, it may sound a bit like a uh, overriding, uh, uh, over, uh, overbearing slide. This is an extra example of a partner organization um, where we have developed a very simple scenario. 
Um, I want to say that simple scenarios are best. If you do scenarios, I wouldn't plan more than five. You know, three is better. Four is, okay, is good as well. If you have 10 scenarios, then it becomes a little bit of a useless management tool. So going to the, to, to the left of the slide here, this organization in this country, I'll obviously anonymize it, planned to implement around 8 million US dollars of uh, program one, two, three, and four over this particular year. And that would have resulted in an unrestricted or an internal cost recovery of you know, just over 10% here, 858,000 US dollar. And if these programs would have been uh, implemented like this, this is the unrestricted they get. So far so good? Easy. Now in a scenario one, they didn't implement, program one didn't implement 6.5 million, but only 5.8. Program two was on track. Program three also slightly below. Program four was slightly below. This can easily happen if a procurement is delayed or if a, a key member of staff leaves and, uh, or if something happens on the country, bad weather, drought, whatever, uh, and a major program is slightly behind the, the burn rate or slightly behind the expectation. Now that results in a total reduction of uh, only 800,000 or so um, reduction in implemented costs. So this is the number you report against your donors. This, of course, reduces your ICR and your unrestricted because unrestricted income is a function of implemented programs often. So the money you can get to keep from this is no longer 560,000 rounded, but around 707 or a reduction of almost $90,000. Now that reduction of $90,000, let's keep that in mind. we we'll get to that in a second. I'll jump to the scenario three, um, where there is a material decline in uh, for, uh, implementation and you see a massive increase in the ICR reduction. If we go to scenario three and go straight down here, you see that instead of 800,000, we've only implemented around about 600,000. This is about 20% reduction if I do my math right. That means that 20% that, um, uh, reduction or so results in a massive reduction in the unrestricted, I, a, um, a higher than double increase in the reduction of the unrestricted from 90,000 to 230,000. Now bear that in mind and see how it's developing. A reasonable, uh, a what, possible reduction in implementation um, funding results in a significant reduction in unrestricted. And many NGOs are simply not aware of what that does to costs, particularly in an INGO. So let's look into that. What is the effect of that? Here we are. The experience that we have, or my, my colleagues and I around the world have from working with NGOs on this level of detail me, uh, shows us that many of our clients simply haven't understood the impact of that programmatic spending reduction on their HQ or their head office budgets because head office budgets or HQ uh, and many other costs are often paid from unrestricted. So the income changes uh, for this HQ revenue and expenditure based uh, on the amount of implementation happening. And that makes it far more likely for the organization to have to draw on their reserves. Basically, the uh, organizational structure, the core structure that does all the back office services for uh, the programs are often at risk at drawing to their uh, reserves, and they are at greater risk than the program offices that are often in the country offices. So we saw this reduction here. If the budget has a, uh, the HQ has a budget expenditure of 5.2 million, and there's a, a plans for a surplus of 300,000, that's usually um, the, the core offices do not plan for a massive surplus, but a healthy one, then in the three scenarios we've seen, in just two scenario steps and it's you know, up to only 20% reduction in implementation, this results in a reversal of the uh, surplus here to a loss over here. So the effect on OHQ, the effect on what holds the core cost together is exponentially higher in the, uh, um, as, the reduction, as the program implementation goes slightly down. And bear in mind that Revenue and the reduction, as you saw earlier, didn't massively change. We're not taking about half of the income. We're not talking about you know, pandemic-style 
50% reduction in program implementation, we, we mentioned a 20% reduction only, and the effect can be quite heavy. So hopefully, this little mathematical example sensitizes you a little bit or helps you a little bit on um, drawing attention to why scenario planning is so important and why the effect on HQ revenue and expenditure is so much greater than for program implementing, implementing offices. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, it's very easy. First of all, you send a template out to all country offices to complete. And this could be as simple as, uh, no, sorry, as simple as this. What's your budget implementation? What's your forecast and recovery rate? You probably have that information anyway. You may even have it in this format. If you don't, it's a simple template. You can use this as a guide. You really want to focus on income first because that is the easier part. <coughs> Apologies. That is the easier part to forecast. Most people are aware of their program's income. So then ask question, how much of this can reasonably be implemented? What is the impact of fundraising? Do we raise any more funding of this? And what can we agree with donors? Can you agree, for example, proactively to keep your unrestricted as there were because there's simply a delay in the implementation, not a cancellation? If we are going proactive to donors for this, the answer is usually yes which is another reason we want to do financial planning. Then we obviously, as I said initially, delay and reduce variable expenses. We know that expenses aren't as variable as income often, but at least we can manage them. Then we really want to forecast our fixed expenditure. So the things we can, um, that cannot be reduced in immediately and ultimately forecast the impact of all this on the scenario. These may sound technical. I hope you see that it is not Great math. All you need is plus and minus here. It's a table um, of uh, our income, our variable cost, our fixed cost, and then what is the scenario down there. And a good reduction in a uh, good forecast is if you do three forecasts like we've done here, 10, 25, or 26, and 40% reduction. And then you're pretty much got it covered. So if something happens, if a procurement fails, or if you, an office cannot perform as much as you like to, you can and have a face a reduction in program implementation of say 15%, you immediately know you're in between those two scenarios. So what's our reduction like? Oh, we should have a reduction of between 320 and 800,000 without even going back to the numbers. You know on that afternoon when you get the message that you're facing of, you can quantify the potential financial impact. And that enables you to do good management decisions. Otherwise, if these things happen, you have to wait for days and days to quantify the, the impacts. I really hope that that helps a bit. What do you do with information? Visualize it. We usually visualize it in something as simple as this. You know, you really want to focus on the critical areas. Don't become too technical. Engage with the right level, mostly senior management, and show them that this is what we plan for. This is what we have. We are look, looking between scenario one and two. This is the worst case scenario. Visualizing these results makes that communicating the impact so much more effective and bearing in mind as well that you're communicating to people who really, really care about the organization, the program, and they uh, really need to understand the impact of this one. So a simple um, stacked uh, visualization and graphic, you can produce it in any uh, tabular software will help you visualize the impact much better than the tables I've shown earlier. Remember that most people are visual learners, of course. And then finally, what's what's good here? Oops, sorry, I went back. What's what, what, uh, what, what does a good scenario plan look like? Well, you really want to do sort of three to five, as I said. You know, you condense it into manage, um, the, the three possibilities outcomes should be condensed into some sort of manageable financial information designed to facilitate decision-making. You're not financial reporting here. You don't want to get too busy on where the information comes from. What does this mean? Um, you really want to discuss the outcome of these conversations. What happens if the forecast is good, medium, or bad? And then you really want to use the latest budget to illustrate. What is our impact on revenue and costs? What's our potential reduction in the budget? Um, how does that impact our reserves? What other opportunities in the pandemic or otherwise does this bring up? And what's our future plan for scaling it up again? 
what do we need to do now in order to be back up where we wanted to be in four to six months time. So it allows you to have, in summary, it allows you to have conversations that you otherwise wouldn't have. And good financial scenario planning is just a helpful tool to have fact-based and evidence-based conversations about what if and what how we act if something happens. And that's my main message for you today. I hope it wasn't too technical. I hope you took something from it. And now we get to any questions if you have any. But I believe, Jules, before we get to the questions, that you have a couple of upcoming webinar announcements. Is that right? Yes, I can let everyone know about the next webinars. So our next webinar is on the 19th of July. It will be on 10 tips to improve your proposal budget. This is always a very popular topic. So we welcome you to register for that. And then following that on the 2nd of August, it's five tips to secure commercial contracts. So another very interesting webinar. Um, Chris can impart some knowledge to all of us. So please do sign up on our website uh, under MZN events, you will see it just under training courses, which we would also love for you to take a look at. Thanks, Chris. Great. Um, let's get to the questions. We have a few, we have 20 more minutes or so. Yeah, sure. So we've had a few questions come through. Um, our first question is from a few questions actually from Mech Sibanda. Uh, the first question was How can one implement the daily cash flow behavior? I can implement the daily cash flow behavior. I'm not entirely certain, Mac, what you mean with daily cash flow behavior. What I meant about the cash flow scenario planning is where you plan for when payments and receipts are hitting your bank account, not what you're due. So, for example, you might have won a grant that hasn't paid out yet. Um, you're getting an income, but you, you might not get that income until two, three, six months down the line until the donor has paid out. Um, and that helps you to uh, plan for that income. So you don't have your expenditure in January when you're only getting the income in March. That helps. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Mech, if you would like to ask us anything more on that, please do send another question. Um, so Meg did ask a couple more questions. How can an NGO develop and fund a financial sustainability plan that needs income injection for a startup? Well, right. starting up an NGO is always difficult. And uh, starting any organization is always difficult. I've done it a few times. Um, and so it can be uh, quite tough. Um, the bottom line is without any sort of resources, either in time, energy, and certainly financials, your, uh, the line between failure and startup is probably much shorter and um, a, a ambitious startup needs to have you know, decent funding. Um, at inception point, there are various uh, funding available. The most common one, of course, is equity. So most people who start an organization first invest their own money. Um, there are various innovation funds out there, but even then you need the money and the time to write fantastic proposals to innovation funders out there. Um, I highly recommend that you um, join the quarterly donor update of my colleagues um, that will have some, some information about innovation funding coming up in September, the next quarter end, I believe. It is. It is. Thank you very much, Schultz. Um, and um, if, uh, uh, we also see a, a lot of more corporate and commercial contracts funding going into new startups. But also there you need to just the establishment and the setup costs you probably have to carry by yourself. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, gonna ask a question from Phil and then the last one from Mech again. Um, so Phil just asked, when people say no cost extension, are there still costs for the NGO because of delayed payments? Yeah, Phil, that's a really good question. No cost extension is an absolute falsehood. So for everybody here, a no cost extension is a no cost to the donor, not to the organization. And that's the big, big difference. A no cost extension is where the NGO basically says to the donor, hey, exactly in that scenario, we weren't able to uh, forecast uh, to implement quite as much costs as we wanted to. So our burn rate is lower than the budget. You need to extend our agreement by three, six months, nine months, but there's no additional cost to that for a multiple of reasons. The problem is that if you have a break in the uh, that no cost extension, you still carry the 
same overhead costs and the same management costs for that three to six months. And it's only partially paid by the, over, uh, by the unrestricted. Presumably, Phil, you have accepted a grant with, with that level of unrestricted because for that time, say three, four years, they cover your overheads. If not, that's a whole different you know, uh, problem there. If it doesn't cover your overheads, we have a, you have a, a, a grant acceptance problem. If it does, then that could no longer be the case if the uh, extension just happens for several months. And the longer the extension is, the worse it gets um, because the overheads aren't covered. So when we say no cost extension, I've seen <clears throat> other NGO leaders sort of shrug their shoulders and say, well, it's just no cost extension. I mean, it doesn't cost us anything. Yeah, it does. It's your donor who doesn't get any more costs. The organization certainly does. Okay, great. Thank you. Phil also says thanks in the question. So. Yeah, um, <laughs> our last question from Mick. Uh, how can we tap on unrestricted funds and any links? And do we have any links currently available to unrestricted funds? fund partners or donors for community organizations? No, I'll be very clear on this one. There are There is no easy money to be made. Um, the uh, particular startup organization um, will need to prove its metal, will need to prove its innovation and its implementing capacity uh, for a number of years before it can tap into its national donors. Bear in mind that even large national organizations find it very hard to break into institutional donors because they may not have worked regionally or nationally even yet. And finally, um, there is this myth that um, they're just because, and it's partially donors' fault, but they say we want to you know, deregulate, we want to deconstruct, and we want to work with localization. The fact of the matter is that many of them don't. Um, they will. They have a duty to the taxpayers. Um, and the same thing with foundations and corporates, by the way. Um, and there is no such thing as uh, simply uh, finding some unrestricted money to start up. The only person who does that are investors. And there are more and more private equity firms, and we see more and more funds of funds in the finance sector, as we said in the last quarterly update on donors and income, um, that are pushing into the area. If they are convinced by your pitch, then they will give you unrestricted funding but it's a very different donor game. Great, thank you for that, Chris. Um, oh, just one more question has just popped through um, from Vedas there. Uh, what are the minimum requirements for startup NGO to get funds? It's a really good question, Vedas. I would love to know where you're from. It's an interesting name. Um, but the the um, minimum requirements could be summarized in, or could be separated into qualitative and quantitative, and it depends on what funding you're looking at. Um, so if you're looking from foundations or corporate foundations or family, uh, um, uh, family foundations, or if you're looking from institutional donors, the small and the big. If we're looking at um, the qualitative side, then you definitely need you know, convincing personnel, a very convincing theory of change, a very clear business plan behind it that has um, a logic rationale to it as part of the logic model, which you can also I think there's a webinar on that as well. And some in our um, in our uh, history uh, on our, our channels, um, and a very clear, convincing uh, implementation capacity uh, that is very clear. On the quantitative side, um, to get more funding, we need to have done. We need, we need to usually have demonstrated that we are capable of managing the administrative burdens of donor funding, and they are significant. It has happened, but it happens very rarely that a donor or be it a foundation or an international donor, uh, institutional donor is awarding more than half a million to a complete new organization because they are, haven't got a track record of managing that amount of funding. And that is pretty much, um, so you need to, need to work your way up, basically. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, a few more questions are popping through here. So we still have about five to 10 minutes. Um, Phil has just asked, how much should management do this by themselves and how much with professional help? Well, it's again a very good question. Um, I've, as I said at the beginning, this very basic financial scenario planning that I've just shown here absolutely can be done internally. 
what where I think uh, professional help or externals come in and what their biggest advantage is, is that they see a lot, I, I see, for example, a lot of organizations every year. Amazon works with around 300 NGOs every year. And that means we get a sort of a bird's eye view and a comparative, which management in the organization might be a, a little bit, uh, you know, naive from, because they haven't seen in other organizations or peer organizations in a, in a few years. So I think this peer review and getting a second pair of eyes on your existing scenario planning is very, very useful. It can be done very ch cheaply because it's it's not a major piece of work, um, but looking in under the hood and getting a sense check can be quite useful. Basic financial planning as presented in this webinar, however, Phil, should absolutely be part of you know, monthly financial management of a monthly reporting to uh, internally. Uh, and if it isn't, then um, hopefully this webinar has given you a starting point. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, Vedaste has asked us another question. Uh, is there a list of existing foundations we can contact and ask for funds? Yeah, so again, I would refer this question to our quarterly funding update. Um, and um, there is uh, there's a ton of foundations out there. All of them will need a very specific pitch. Uh, so blanket bombing, carpet bombing, five uh, or 50 foundations with a single outreach is very unlike, unlikely to yield any success. Great, thank you. Uh, we have an anonymous question here. Mm -hmm. uh, in the scenario where the cost is high and income is low, how can contracts be managed within minimum time to avoid risk of further loss, especially the contract with costs which are not absor absorbed in the project budgets. Um, whoever asked that question, this is exactly the question on, on, on um, no cost extension we discussed earlier. Um, the fundamental injustice here is that uh, donors want certain programs to happen, but they outsource the risk of doing them to the grantees at a very low premium. So if we think about it, most institutional donors will give you between sort of five to 15, 17% of unrestricted funding, which means if you have a program direct expenditure of say $100, they give you $115 to manage that program. That's a low premium for implementing difficult programs in complex environments, sometimes which are conflict um, affected as well. Um, that's a, you know, that's a whole different thematic. We could wonder whether that is a reasonable ask. Um, but worst of all, they then you know, will not pay you any additional unrestricted if implementation takes longer. And if you don't manage the implementation, they will ask for the money back. Um, so the scenario planning here is so essential to be done at every stage of your program management in order to know exactly what financial impact you have if, and sometimes when, your program implementation is affected in any way, delayed or done differently. And that is what is so important to, um, to ensure that we scenario plan and don't just, you know, don't just report against the budget. Because the budget is great, but three years into a program, the budget probably has very little um, to do with the actual, with, with, with reality. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, Max just popped another question in here asking about the best practices for NGO survival in times of crises, um, if we have any references for him. Yeah, there's a um, couple of articles on our website that are dealing with uncertainty and management, uh, scenario-based management. I um, uh, would ask that, uh, Jude, would you tell me mind just digging them out from our insights section and um, email them to Mac? Or just make just look at the um, the blog part of the MZ website. Um, I heard from a couple of NGOs that they found two or three of these ones quite quite useful. Of course, I'll pop the link in the chat box shortly. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I hope that helped a little bit. Um, and. Um, I hope that we'll see you all at the next webinars as well. Uh, some of you personally, and please bear in mind what Jules said initially, that if you're an NGO partner and you want to join the training in persona, our strategy is to make 
most of our services subsidized or free of charge by 2030. We've gotten there with training already for our MZM partners. Uh, if you are one, please um, sign up and I hope to see you, some of you then very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for managing this, Jules. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Chris. Bye. Bye.